Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to IS Test Automation and Continuous Delivery Pipeline webinar. And we're going to get started. We're not going to wait for everybody else to join. We're going to have recording this webinar. Thus, uh, for those who's going to miss the introduction, they can watch that uh, in the recording later on. So, um, for, before I start a formal introduction, I would like to thank uh, our uh, sponsor, which is Hatspin. Hatspin is a device cloud, which is uh, providing services to run uh, manual and automated tests, uh, as well as uh, other forms of uh, internalization globalization on real devices across the globe. So, who's going to be speakers for today? Myself, Igor, um, I'm currently Android Release Manager at Tinder, formerly worked as the Test Automation Architect and Manager at the companies such as uh, Expedia, Barnes & Noble, and other startups and projects. Build uh, continuous delivery and continuous integration solutions for mobile farms uh, across different enterprises. And uh, we have another uh, speaker, Boris. Boris is currently IS uh, Engineer at Tinder. Uh, working uh, on interesting features, and uh, he is also a big fan of the cryptocurrency, and uh, uh, he is a big fan of teaching uh, and promoting different uh, boot camps and webinars. So before we are moving forward with our presentation for today, I would like to ask you to write your questions. If you have a question during a presentation, there is the questions block in a go to webinar. Uh, Please write them ahead of time, and right at the end, we'll have time to answer for the few of them. I'm not going to promise we're going to answer to all of them, um, but we're going to definitely pick up uh, the most valuable questions, so feel free. So what's the agenda for today's webinar? We're going to talk about XUI test in the context, what it is, why we need to use it. Um, and the most important uh, uh, topic we're going to cover today is how to make functional tests ready for the continuous integration. In today's world, your tests are not going to run on your Xcode environment. They're most likely going to run somewhere uh, remotely on uh, uh, integrated systems such as Jenkins, Circle, Travis CI, uh, and uh, we'll have to uh, stop some sort of bugs in the system. So we're going to uh, talk about different approaches, how to make your test resilient and ready for the CI. Also, we're going to talk about uh, global uh, globalization, internalization, is how to roll the products globally and how continuous uh, testing in the continuous delivery pipeline uh, can be leveraged using device farms, which is a very interesting topic nowadays. Um, and and there have been a lot of speculation about uh, either to build device farms locally or use the uh, already uh, established system. So we're going to talk about that as well. So what is the XUI test uh, and exit test? Those two terms been uh, used uh, back and forth, and a lot of people confused, uh, especially those who never have done any uh, Xcode development before. So exit test is actually unit test framework, similar to JUnit if you've done Java before. Um, it's been uh, for a while actually on the market since Xcode 5, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, it's slowly been matured with the additional libraries uh, which were introduced like in Xcode 6, which is performance and measurement testing. And later in Xcode 7, they introduced XUI test, which replaced the older framework uh, UI uh, automation, which is, was there for a while and was kind of outdated. So since Xcode 7, we have XUI test library, which is doing most part for functional automation. And this is not the only library that is used for IES testing. It's also used for the Mac OS X automation and Apple TV automation as well. Uh, the only caveat to this, uh, that XUI test only work on IES 9 and higher, uh, which a year ago was a problem, but I think we are slowly moving away for the earlier support of IES 8, so shouldn't be any problem moving on forward. So there are pros of XUI tests. It's extremely easy to learn, no additional installation of components required, unlike those people who tried Apium before and spent days to start the Apium uh, server. And just before even starting writing a single test, I used to spend like uh, a number of hours. But however, uh, XUI tests make it so simple to jump started and in a minute you can write your test. 
Also, uh, uh, the Apple team added the recording feature, which is uh, really helpful for the beginners who are entering to the space uh, of automating uh, functional tests uh, in Xcode environment. And that's helped you uh, to jumpstart your project really quick. Um, it is much faster than other popular cross-functional platform um, uh, solutions. Uh, and uh, you will see that during the demo. It works with both Swift and Objective-C for a lot of people ask me that question uh, when I um, present the topic in different uh, meetups and webinars is like, what about the legacy code? What if our project still in Objective-C? Can we write the test in Objective-C? Yes, you can. Although uh, we already at the Swift for uh, 4.0. 4.1 or 4.2, uh, we are with Swift 4 right now. So we Swift became more mature language than it used to be two years ago. And a lot of companies, um, including Tinder, that's where we work right now, uh, we are uh, using Swift. So a lot of people get scared to use the XUI test because they think they have to learn a lot of uh, uh, Xcode development. Uh, it's not true. You do not have to learn everything about Xcode development. Uh, there, we're talking about literally five classes in a very uh, easy to learn library. There is XUA element query class, which is responsible for finding, locating UI elements uh, on the screen. There is XUA element class, which is responsible for UI element and application themselves. Uh, and there is XUA application, which is a proxy uh, of application under test that can be launched and terminated. So they're usually like similar to Espresso. It's going to be two versions of app running, your application under test and a, like kind of a service app, which is a proxy for your test. And there's XUA screenshot, which was uh, recently added with the Xcode 9, which enables you to take screenshot. It was most wanted feature for past year and a half uh, uh, asked from Apple and they delivered it literally uh, in September 2017. Now you can take a screenshot upon the failures and have a, a comprehensive report uh, for CI system. And there's XU device class, which is really you know, straightforward to simulate physical buttons on iPhone, device orientation, and uh, recently introduced Siri interaction. So you can actually automate Siri if you need to. So the biggest question people ask me who never have seen XUI test before, how long it takes to write uh, a new test from scratch in XUI test? And uh, the answer for this is gonna be a quick demo. The Boris is gonna right now, uh, gonna do a quick demo of writing a new XUI test from ground zero and everybody will witness that. Thank you, Igor. So I would like to prove that entering to the UI testing with XUI test is really easy. Um, let me show you an example. So I have a template here. This is a totally empty class uh, with a setup and teardown. And we, right now, will write our first test. I will use the recording feature uh, by Xcode. Let's start. Uh, test, first test, yeah? We need to name our funks with uh, the test. So that's why uh, it, it's named from, from the test. OK, so um, let's call it thinking. One second, let me build once again. Here is it. Yes, nice. So uh, this is record UI test. Let's try and see is it enough for our test. This is our app. Here's it. So we have two types of authentication here, Facebook and without authentication. So we'll use that right now. So we are performing different actions. Uh, the application is about um, making orders in different uh, restaurants. So let's uh, try to uh, see what, what can we do here. For instance, we can uh, detect table. 
on real iPhones, uh, this is the camera with a QR code scanning, but for UI testing purposes, it has this screen with selecting table mock. Um, and now we can, for instance, call a waiter and ask a waiter to bring a menu. We can wait a confirmation from the server side and tap OK here. That's our first test. Let's stop recording and see what we get, what we got. So as you see, uh, we have um, this a little bit weird record recording, but let's try to reproduce it and see, does it actually work? So um, I'll try to do right now, just, just play it. It tries to detect different elements and literally records every action, which is really good for start. And as you see, it works. Test. Failed. Um, so, yes, first of all, it's not stable at all, this recording feature. However, uh, it's really easier now to see what we have and try to fix it um, right now. And to be honest, I'm thinking it's, let's try again. So what the board is trying to say that recording feature will enable you to start writing a test if you've never done this before without a, any coding experience. However, it's not gonna add assertions, validation automatically for you. It's not gonna create explicit and implicit waiting for you out of the box. And it's not gonna decorate the test for uh, professional uh, execution uh, or enterprise execution. It's just the beginning uh, to explore the XUI test features. That's what he tried to show you that it's really, really easy to start. Now it succeeds. So you see, it's not that stable. We need to refactor it much more than we did right now. Uh, however, we see our first test, which is huge plus. Thank you, Boris, uh, for the quick demo. And as you can see, literally in three minutes, Boris was able to pull the first test without any like literally coding on the screen and uh, Xcode. As you can see, the syntax of Swift is extremely simple. The language is, uh, I would say, one of the new generation languages which uh, encapsulate great features out of Python, out of Java, out of Ruby. Uh, it's very readable. Uh, so um, uh, it's really, really easy for the beginners uh, to dive into XUTS. So don't be scared. Uh, you know, on your own, you can always experiment, pick up any of our open source application from GitHub and you know you can start in a minute. I've seen this before, so um, I will show you a quick recording of a continuous delivery pipeline and show you the most important parts which differentiate the continuous uh, delivery with continuous integration. So as you can see on the screen right now, I recorded uh, exactly the same test that Boris showed you uh, that runs in the CI. Uh, it's actually Jenkins. Jenkins is a server that plays the roles of a continuous integration system. And right now, as you can see on the screen, um, there is right now the build job happening. What's a build job? Every time developer makes the commit with the new changes in the application, it triggers the build job, which builds the IS binary. It actually builds the application itself. And uh, upon successful uh, uh, build process, it triggers our existing regression test through the next UI test and it runs it against that build. So every time developers makes a new change, we run all the tests that have available against those changes. This way, we are speed up, up our uh, regression process by validating most important parts of application and also the end-to-end -end flows of application. So the biggest challenge in the industry is not about writing tests. It's about writing tests that are gonna, gonna be very stable 
will not flake out and will always report either there is a bug in the application or the test outdated. There shouldn't be a third state, right? So as you can see right now, we have a, a stable test run, uh, which shows that our test passed in CI. And uh, when we go back into the pipeline, we'll see that there is a third step will be the, uh, the distribution job, which is actually take that build and distribute to the beta channels such as Fabric beta or could be Crashlytics, uh, sorry, could be the test flight, uh, hockey app. There are so many distribution services available for distributing the app. So the main idea of continuous delivery is that without human intervention, you build, test, deploy the application continuously on each developer's change. So again, coming back to our previous slide, when we uh, ask ourselves a question is, why do I need to run XUI test in the CI? And the answer is, because we would like to stop developer if they break something or feature or they break the code uh, or some sub feature or subset of features in an application before the code uh, is made to the app, which is distributed to the beta users. So again, is recording enough for CI? Absolutely not. It's just the beginning. In order for us to scale our test for the continuous integration slash continuous delivery system. Again, I will emphasize continuous integration means that we're continuously building, continuously testing. Continuous delivery means we're continuously building, continuously testing and continuously delivering. So without delivery uh, of the application to the uh, users, again, it could be internal users, external users, this is just CI if the delivery part uh, exhibit in the, uh, in the system, then it's CD, continuous delivery. So again, two most important aspects of the test qualify for the CI is a scalable architecture. You have to make your test scalable. When we have one or two tests, it doesn't matter how we write them. If we have hundreds of them, we need to maintain them. Maintenance becomes the bottleneck for the most teams out there. And therefore, Boris in a minute gonna show you the page objects. What is the page objects architecture and how it's actually done within the XUI test library. And there is a second part uh, in order for the test to uh, make into the CI is the stubbing network responses. Every test that hits the live responses means that hits the live server are most likely gonna be very flaky for two reasons. They, uh, uh, there will be server errors, which is not by any means related to the client. Uh, there will be a B test uh, from the server side uh, where they're gonna experiment with different backend features, which is not controlled from the client and which also can uh, uh, fail your test. And there's a, a lot of scenarios that you cannot automate uh, on against the live server, such as error handling. What if you have to do a lot of negative testing on the client to simulate various uh, server errors? How will you do that? So all these things uh, will be shown during the demo today and how we can handle those things uh, and make our test ready for the continuous integration system. So let's move to the page object patterns. So what's a page object pattern? This is nothing more than architecture of the code using the principle, principles of polymorphism uh, that have been there from day number one of object-oriented programming. Your test becomes very easy to read, very easy to maintain, and removes code duplication. So you will only make a change in one place uh, instead of 10 or 20 places in order to maintain the test. So I'm gonna switch screen right now and Boris is gonna do a quick demo of uh, how the page object uh, architecture looks um, uh, in Xcode. Boris, you good to go? Perfect. Thank you, Igor. So we recorded our test. That's fine, but we need to refactor it. So uh, I've refactored same test. So it it executes same amount of uh, same sequence of actions, and uh, it uses page object pattern and the page object architecture. So first thing that you can notice now this test looks uh, like it read like it's written in English. So you can see every step and it's. Clearly, uh, you can clearly understand what's going on on each step. Um, second, here we use all these strings. Uh, so 
we, for instance, we use uh, the name of the restaurant. What does the name of restaurant will be changed tomorrow? We will need to uh, go and change every instance of our string of name restaurant in dozens of tests. That's not scalable at all. So instead, we have the pattern of page. What is page or screen? For instance, first of all, we create a login screen. Login screen is an abstraction which encapsulate the real login screen on the app, which one is this one. So this is the login screen. What this login screen has? It has two buttons, or continue with Facebook and login later. So my properties here are those two buttons. Moreover, I have a couple of methods. Methods are actions that can, could be performed with this uh, elements. For instance, I can tap on login later button or I can tap on login on Facebook button. This is pretty easy screen. However, uh, once you get more complicated screen with um, more uh, objects and more actions to do, uh, this screen becomes uh, more complicated as well. So now every test that uses login screen can use the login screen class. And the only place where we can change something if some data changed is login screen class. So after that, we tap on tap on login button, we find our restaurant by name, we um, uh, tap on this restaurant. So we perform same actions than before. We type the number of uh, table and we call a waiter. And we have a, an assertion now that we got our alert. So let's run it and make sure it works same as before. And as Boris showed uh, in his uh, page objects demo, that if there is anything changes on the screen, for instance, developers introduce a new button or developers change the uh, layout, you'll have to go to only one place, one class where you have to make the change. You don't have to go 20 places or like, you know, 100 different tests to maintain this. One place, one change. And here is it, we succeeded. Perfect, thank you, Boris. Great demo. I'm not a big fan of the PowerPoint presentations because when I w watch the webinars, I fall asleep. I would like to always, uh, you know, uh, keep the webinars entertaining with the various demos and the new uh, features and new uh, trends in the industry that can make you excited and want to try them out. All right, let me switch the presentation to my screen again. Here we go. So page object pattern will help to make your tests more readable, easy to maintain and scale. However, this is not the full recipe to make a test ready for the continuous integration system. There is a lot of companies such as Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, even uh, Expedia where you uh, worked previously and Tinder where I currently work, uh, they never run the functional test for the clients uh, hitting real life services. A lot of people ask me, what about live tests? Do we need to have end-to-end -end tests? And I think one of the attendees already asked that question. Yes, you need to have end-to-end -end tests, but they cannot be part of continuous integration system. Those tests cannot stop the developer's code because they will not be 100% stable. Live tests, we'll show you later, are good for uh, uh, you know device coverage slash global rollouts where you can want to check if your test uh, is working well uh, or features working well to say correctly in various countries uh, and uh, or you want to see that uh, you know our basic user flow works very well let's see in india as uh, same as in the uk and the united states so for that reason we need that also the live task helps to uh, bring the end-to-end -end performance of application including networking uh, as well as the uh, client side um, profiling which we call a vertical slicing or vertical testing of application with a horizontal testing live tests are not going to work and as you can see right now on the slide i'm going to show you right now uh, i converted the test pyramid in a uh, app architecture on top there is actually uh, the ias uh, app order me that you've seen a minute ago and there is also the rest api layer which is uh, uh, helps the application to talk to the back end so in the real world in order to make test uh, uh, feeding into the ci continuous integration system we cut right here, we can see the cursor on the screen where it says IS app. We cut that layer right over here 
from the rest of, from the uh, communication with the backend. Basically, right in the middle, when our application make a request to find me a restaurant, it's not going to go to the uh, internet. Uh, the solution for this we call stubbing is basically take those responses as if the backend responded and put them as a canned data into the application. So those responses becomes part of the internal server, which is the running on the debug version of the build without exiting uh, to the internet. This way, we can predict the outcome of the application. We can actually uh, tell the application to always get the error, or we can tell application to always get the same restaurant. So we know the data is going to be stable. We know the outcome, so we can control the flow. Therefore, tests become, number one, extremely fast, uh, robust, so we can actually uh, exercise more scenarios which we couldn't exercise with live data. And the most important, they can be run in ACI. Like I said earlier, if they fail, there are only two reasons. Either there is a bug in application or uh, there is a changes that we have to uh, uh, implement in our testing framework. And Boris is going to do right now a demo of a framework which is used uh, uh, in, a XUI test uh, in the XUI test context in Xcode called Ambassador. Ambassador is a lightweight uh, HTTP server which was implemented in Swift and uh, Boris will show you how the test can use that architecture to make uh, our test really, really stable. One second. All right, we're ready. Thank you. So let me show you first. We have some tests which is uh, restrict unauthorized user. So we wanted to make sure that unauthorized user uh, doesn't have an access to certain features. So this is the live test, which means uh, this particular test uh, will run uh, in front of real production server, will hit real production endpoints, and will get real production data with, with real restaurants, yes. Here is it. So you see there is a five, there are five different restaurants. Every restaurant has a menu. Um, and we are trying to make an order. And it does not allow us because we are not authorized. Also, we are trying to reserve place. And we cannot because we are not authorized. OK, now I will show you the same test which is test restrict unauthorized user. However, this one will be stopped. And then I'll show you how did we do that. Here is it. Same, rest, uh, say, same application, same test. However, the data is different. Take a look on the number of restaurants, for instance. Second, here's it. You see, we have only two restaurants. It has another menu. So all those responses are faked. We stop them. So let's wait until it succeeds. So it's same test with same actions. Here's it. Both are succeeded. So we've done that with the help of the ambassador library. Here's it. Um, we know that our app makes some server requests to certain endpoints. Here are they. Some of uh, them get the places, some of them get the menu, some of them do the order, uh, reserve, and so on and so forth. So here we stopped certain responses. For instance, whenever our application will ask server, give me a places that you have. So give me the restaurant. Um, and uh, probably you've seen before, uh, nowadays every application uses JSON to communicate with server. So this is very, very common and very, uh, very easy to use uh, format of data. So we provide our internal JSONs that will be returned instead of data from server. And we provided the JSONs for every possible endpoint that we wanted to mock. 
for instance whenever user uh, wants to make order return this json which fakes the making order it, it it's the same as server side response however different data and so on and so forth that's how we uh, stopped and mocked our our server endpoints thank you boris so one more addition to the comment of the ambassador ambassador think about this the, your application when we are compiling the uh, application we embed that ambassador http server which is the name of the library right it's lightweight server and which is spinning right there on your simulator or device and it you can shut down wi-fi you don't need that anymore uh, it will hit this internal server so as you notice it's really hard to notice on this application but in the real world applications you will see that the test becomes extremely fast because the response is going to come not in the seconds in milliseconds so it has become extremely fast the go go as fast as your application allows you to go so that's the biggest advantage of using the stabbing solution is the speed which is very important. Your tests have to be fast in order to fit in the CI. Stability, right? Because you, know, as Boris showed you, the CAN data will give you predictable outcome, right? However, uh, we have to be also uh, aware of the disadvantages of stopping server. The backend data changes all the time. So uh, with that comes the maintenance. You always have to communicate with backend team, make sure that the JSON schema is up to date and you will also have to update those responses uh, based on the latest changes on the back end so nowadays when we're talking about profession of uh, 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 software developer and test as that right or to test automation uh, engineer uh, whoever calls that name uh, uh, now it's a responsibility of uh, not just you know functionally testing application but also communicate with the backend team understand the uh, architecture of the backend services uh, in the context at least the rest apis what they're returning and keep the uh, front end uh, team with the backend team in sync so basically the role of test automation engineer becomes integral role of maintaining both ends which has become more interesting obviously there is more responsibility and there are more reward Okay, I hope everybody is excited about all these demos. Uh, please, I don't see much questions. Uh, uh, feel free to go in the question session, uh, and go to webinar and ask us any questions that come up in your mind. I'm sure you should have some. You can ask questions about continuous integration. You can ask questions about uh, stubbing. You can ask questions uh, about XUI tests. Feel free to uh, post questions and we'll answer them at the end of this webinar. Okay, so great. Let's say we build the continuous integration slash continuous delivery system. Our tests are stub, very stable. They're running on uh, uh, iPhone simulators and everything is great. So the next question comes uh, uh, in the mind is, um, how to scale IS test automation infrastructure when we go be beyond simulator, right? What if I need to run tests on the different IS versions? What if my manager comes and says, Igor, I would need to run tests on the iPhone 8, iPhone 7, iPhone 6, right, iPhone X. Uh, what about if I have to run on different iOS versions? iOS version 9, 10, 11, and that version, that releases, right? That matrix becomes uh, uh, quite a while uh, and gets out of the hand. What I have to, what I need to do with my CI to support this? And usually in the companies who operate globally, like, uh, for instance, Tinder operate in uh, 170 plus countries or Expedia, same deal. They operate in uh, more than 100 countries around the globe. How your application is actually going to work in those countries? Do you know this answer? Absolutely not. So how to handle this? Right. So what if I need to test my app uh, on a, a device with the provider like Vodafone, right? O2, I mean, it could be there's so many providers around the globe, we have to make sure that uh, that uh, are uh, working well with our application. Uh, a lot of companies have this big unknown. They're basically hoping that if the application works well, very well in France, it should work very well in India. And the history proves otherwise. Unfortunately, it's not uh, working that way. 
So uh, let me throw a poll right now. There's another question we need to answer. Uh, one second. So right now on the screen, you should see another question. Have we used any cloud devices farm in the past? Please answer yes, no. I'm going to wait for a minute. I can see everybody almost done. We still have some participants. Oh, amazing, 11% people said yes and 89% said no. Um, fortunately, uh, if you work in a startup, uh, you're far away from using device farms. Device farms are the, not the, one of the cheapest things to use. However, in companies that are well-funded, uh, this is must-have uh, attribute. And uh, in a minute, we're going to show you a demo of uh, uh, Headspin. And we're going to show you the advantages of Headspin over other devices for and why they are revolutionary. Um, let me close the poll. OK, so a few words before I switch screen. Uh, uh, Boris, uh, let's get ready for the, uh, for the device farm. Perfect. So I personally use about four different uh, uh, cloud devices farm in my career. And I'll tell you they're all different. Uh, some of them have distribution solutions where you can use uh, kind of crowd farms where uh, all devices are shared across different companies, which is not pleasant for the security. It means that your app, a new version of app with new features can link and everybody can see that accidentally. Uh, most of them offer the private clouds where they give you a subset of devices only reserved for your company, which is more expensive, obviously, but that you don't have to maintain those devices. Uh, but all of the devices farm has a very common attribute. They are come with a set of iPhones and Android phones, uh, reside somewhere in data center, uh, usually in one data center, maybe one or two, depends on the company size. Like AWS device farm have quite a few data centers, but they're all connected to Wi-Fi. So meaning that regardless of which phone you're testing on, either manually or running your automated test, you're always hitting the Wi-Fi. So what the hats been brought at the table, which is, in my opinion, is revolutionary, is really hard to achieve, is that they have physical devices and a physical location around the globe. So imagine there is a set of devices are in Japan, Tokyo. There is another set of devices also in Japan, but not in Tokyo. They could be like in Nagano. Or let's say there's a set of devices in San Francisco. Another set of devices are in New York. Uh, and Another amazing fact about Headspin, those devices not only connected to Wi-Fi, they're also connected to real providers. So they have a SIM cards inside of them, right? That means that when you are running either manual test or running automated test, you can hit a real service provider. And Headspin gives you amazing reports, which is very valuable. They give you performance, how the app is performed in that particular location. So let's say your app might take uh, up to five seconds to authenticate in France, at the same time might take 25 seconds to authenticate in the Thailand. So this way you will know what you have to do in order to tweak your application to perform equally well, or what you have to do with your backend services, how you have to distribute it globally to support global rollouts. So Headspin answer all these questions. And Boris is gonna do a quick demo of a Headspin um, uh, Headspin features as well. Going to show that how we're going to run exactly the same test you've seen on a physical device uh, on the Headspin cloud. Thank you, Igor. Here is a set of different locations across the globe. For instance, we have uh, we have both Android and iPhones here. Uh, we are interested in iOS right now. So we have iOS devices uh, based in Japan, Great Britain and San Francisco. For instance, so let's go to San Francisco and we see that we have three different iPhones, iPhone 6, iPhone 7 Plus, and one more iPhone 7 Plus uh, with different serial numbers 
different carriers. That's what uh, was to Igor talking about. Uh, this device is real T-Mobile, has real T-Mobile SIM card with the internet. And um, this one is Sprint. This is the Verizon. So we can test everything that we want. Here's different network types, LTE or GSM. Um, device ID, OS, and uh, real phone numbers. So now let's go to iPhone 6, for instance. Headspin allows us to test both manually and automated tests. For instance, for manual testing, we're just preparing device. We need to wait a couple of seconds and we'll have an access to this phone. Not only the access to the phone, uh, you can make this phone with the Headspin APIs as if it's connected to a computer. So let's say you have this uh, iPhone 6 real device connected via the USB cable to your Mac. That's the advantage. You can literally do that, uh, which is amazing for both manual and automated tests. Here's it. There is an iPhone. This is our order me application, which is right now is running on the real iPhone 6, which is which sits in San Francisco. Amazing, yeah? There's it. Can you boys show the uh, uh, the performance reports? Yes. Um, so maybe after demo. Yeah, this is the demo. Yeah, for the yeah. automated test. Okay, so moreover, Headspin allows us to record every test case. Um, for instance, right now we before before this uh, webinar we ran uh, the same test, which is uh, like restrict unauthorized users, on this real device based in San Francisco. And here's it. This is the session recording session. We can scroll it. We can uh, push it back and forth and we see how it was performing on every step on every iteration of of this test here's it you see yeah and that was a live test uh, so there is a um, i would say there is no reason to run mock test uh, on the device cloud uh, in the CI, I need the speed, and I would recommend to run the test in the CI on the emulators or simulators just to get a quick feedback. But when uh, we have few live flows, that's hitting live services, you would like to exercise them, uh, you know, before you roll out, roll out your new version of the app. This is a great tool to uh, do a global rollout and see how the app performs in terms of speed, features, and also the languages and how everything is rendered across a globe. Perfect. So um, I think we're uh, ready for Q&A session. Uh, so let me, give me one second. Okay. Actually, one more thing we'd like to show before Q&A session is how uh, those tests can be uh, integrated to the uh, Headspin. Uh, and Boris uh, uh, created a demo, a video demo, which we, he, he's going to walk you through right now uh, what's happening um, in the context of wiring the test uh, uh, for the Headspin. Boris? This is a script that uh, allowed us to um, to run those tests on, on the head spin. So we just execute the script. Um, right now we're doing this locally, but also we can do this on Jenkins. We can set up this, um, this process, same as local tests. So it takes a while to execute. So let's scroll a little bit. So here's it. This is our device, which has device ID. This is iPhone 6. That's the same iPhone 6 in San Francisco. So it executes test. We use the library XCPretty to uh, generate the HTML and JUnit uh, reports. 
Um, so here is it. So we executed this test without failure, it succeeded, and immediately we get this recording on the head spin, which I showed you two minutes ago. Yep, and you can run on more than one device. Uh, you can run on a batch of devices, uh, your XUA test, and then uh, if any of the tests failing for several, for various reasons, we can always watch the recording and kind of get a hit what's going on on that particular device. Again, my recommendation, if you use device farms, run the live test so you get a full performance uh, and you can see the difference in delays in terms of responses. Head spin is coming with a burst UI, which is performance UI for uh, XUA test very soon. Right now, you if you use Apium framework, you can, you can get out of the box. If you run many, you also get out of the box. Android phones have that, uh, but uh, XUA test is coming, uh, support for XUA test and running these uh, uh, you know, performance reports during test execution is coming uh, in a very new, near future. So Headspin is a new company, uh, but they have, in my opinion, the most potential. Uh, we use them here at the Tinder. I know a lot of companies, enterprises start using them because of their unique capabilities that nobody has in the market. So I guess we're ready for Q&A session, uh, which is fun. I love Q&A sessions. So um, I'm gonna be very selective. We have 10 minutes left for our webinar. So, um, well, good question. What if my backend team changes responses every day? Do I need to also change um, uh, your log, uh, local mocks? Uh, so the answer for this question is interesting uh, because uh, I never seen the team that changes the backend every day. Uh, there could be, uh, the data might change, but the uh, JSON schema most likely not. In my experience, it may change rapidly, uh, most likely bi-weekly because backend uh, uh, may roll out major features, but uh, in my again, experience, uh, even Boris can uh, prove me other, otherwise if I'm wrong, it's not, it doesn't happen every day. Even not weekly, even, even if they change something weekly, they will never kill old setup, old, old JSON schemas. So uh, the real changes may happen like once in a half year, maybe not, not, not. Like oh, every other month. Yeah. If the, it happens every day because you work in a startup to try to roll out new things, then you're not ready for automation yet. <laughs> That's the answer to the question. I mean, it could be an exception. Uh, another great question I like, how do you run tests on the CI CD for 10 different languages? The answer, you don't. You usually run against a major language. If your application works with English, runs again in English, run your all tests against the English. If your major language is French, run, run your tests against the French. What happens to other languages? Uh, uh, my recommendation use a screenshot. There is an amazing uh, capability of XUI test to take screenshots. There is another framework called Snapshot from the fast lane. You can take screenshots on every screen. There is a lot of uh, uh, frameworks that enable you to take a screenshot based on uh, uh, every screen navigation. Let's say your app has 20 screens, you'll take 20, screen 20 screenshots per language and then examine them how the app looks. So this is much more valuable uh, approach for uh, internalization rather than running exactly the same functional test. Functionality will be most likely the same across different countries, plus minus one or two features. So there is no uh, need to invest a lot of money and make a test uh, working. However, XUI tests have a, a mechanism called the uh, accessibility identifiers, which do not get translated. Uh, and those identifiers will work uh, when you use them in your test, both on English or any other language. So the answer, you can do it, but I wouldn't recommend using screenshots uh, instead as approach. So I think the another question, so do we need to marking with device farms? Uh, I don't recommend. A mock test should run uh, on the local uh, setup using the emulators or simulators, you need the speed. Uh, CI always requires speed. For instance, uh, in many companies, they will give you a maximum time you can run the test, uh, up to 15, 20 minutes maximum. So you have to stay with those time boundaries. You won't be able to do it with device farm because they're slower. So my recommendation 
for continuous integration, continuous delivery systems, use the tests that run uh, as fast as possible. And uh, once a release or twice a release, you can run against device farms uh, with the live data to get performance and the overall experience. How do exit tests helping testing cross-platform? There is a config uh, web and changes that as a mobile. Um, okay, so uh, let me read this question. How do exit tests help in testing cross-platform? For example, there is config on the web and changes to affect mobile uh, app. So XC test uh, is not cross-platform library. XC UI test library only for native applications. All it has capability to uh, test the web view in some extent. If you need to test mobile web or web, you need to use WebDriver, which is a separate framework. Uh, this is strictly for IES native automation, and I would keep it in those boundaries. I think uh, we run out of the questions. All of you ask really good questions. Thank you guys for the participation in the webinar. This is the first webinar uh, that we perform on behalf of Headspin. I would like to thank them again for sponsoring us. Uh, we are planning to have these webinars regularly on a monthly basis with various speakers talking uh, from different companies. We're gonna try to focus on mobile. Uh, which is the most hot topic nowadays, Android, IES, cloud, farms, performance, and everything that relates to mobile nowadays. So uh, uh, wait for a new email from us uh, with the new webinars. We're going to email you tomorrow with the recording of this webinar. And again, Boris, thank you so much for helping me out uh, um, and all of you for attendance. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, guys.